Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this lecture, we're going to be discussing the first generation antipsychotics. And if you guys don't know, on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Mad Medicine, you can find all of our step one psychiatry videos. So go ahead and go there. And don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. And with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, let's start our discussion with the first generation antipsychotics, also known as the typical antipsychotics, right? Those are our typical antipsychotics. And these consist of haloperidol, pimazide, trifluperazine, flufenazine, thy thyridazine, and chlorpromazine. These are the drugs you definitely need to know for step one. The two that I wrote in a different bullet point, I wrote them because these uh, names don't really follow a certain uh, you know, preset, whereas in these drug names, you have the, the suffix A-Z-I-N-E already associated. So if you see that suffix, most likely it's going to be a first gen with the exception of pimazide and haloperidol. So definitely commit that to memory. Now, these are usually used for the treatment of many disorders like schizophrenia, especially the positive symptoms. And this is most likely what you're going to see on step one, uh, what the antipsychotics are used for. But you can also use it for psychosis in general, either drug-induced or, you know, um, otherwise. You can also use it in bipolar disorders and delirium, Tourette's and Huntington's disease. You can have it as well as OCD. And delirium, uh, if a patient presents with delirium, whether after a uh, surgery or if they're in the hospital and the patient becomes delirious, you can still use haloperidol to treat them, a first-generation antipsychotic. So keep that in mind. Now, when it comes to the mechanism of action of first-gen, you are going to end up blocking the postsynaptic D2 dopamine receptors. Okay. Now, these D2 dopamine receptors function, they especially function in the mesolimbic and the striatal frontal systems. But uh, first gen can also affect other receptors like the muscarinic, the serotonin, alpha-1, histamine receptors can also be affected. So it's not just D2, even though D2 receptors are the main target for these drugs. Now let's review dopamine receptors really quickly so you guys have a good understanding of what happens. When it comes to the D2 receptors, we have two main types. We have the D1 receptor, which activates uh, adenyl cyclase, and this leads to increased cyclic AMP levels. Then you have the D2 receptor, which deactivates adenyl cyclase, so you need to decrease D2, uh, so decrease cyclic AMP uh, levels. Now, when you have a uh, first gen antipsychotic, you are blocking the D2 receptor. You are blocking this receptor right here. And by blocking this receptor, you are not going to have a decrease in cyclic AMP. In fact, you are going to have an increase in cyclic AMP. Now, the one thing to understand is that this means that in your body, you're going to have low dopamine levels. Why is that the case? Well, normally, if dopamine binds to D2, right, you're going to decrease cyclic AMP. And uh, because you're blocking D2, dopamine is only going to bind to D1. By binding to D1, you're going to have... So let's write this down. So you're going to have increased D1 receptor binding. By binding to this, you're going to have increased, uh, you're going to have increased sorry, cyclic AMP. But this cyclic AMP is going to lead to a negative feedback leading to decreased dopamine production to even out the amount of increased cyclic AMP that is occurring. So just keep that in mind. Now, when it comes to the main effect of these first-gen antipsychotics, you are going to increase cyclic AMP. So if they ask you on step one, what is the immediate cause? What is the main cause of first-gen? It's not to increase dopamine. It's to increase cyclic AMP, all right? That's what ends up happening in the neurons. Now, in these first-gen antipsychotics, we have two main types. We have the high-potency antipsychotics, which consist of haloperidol, trifluperazine, and flufenazine. Very, very important you guys understand it because these three drugs have the most side effect profile when it comes to any of the antipsychotics, in my opinion, uh, in some of my opinions, fact. But uh, definitely commit haloperidol, trifluperazine, and flufenazine into your memory. This is very high yield, and you're going to see why in a second. 
and then you have the low potency ones. But these drugs have the most neurologic side effects and extrapyramidal symptoms, which we're going to talk about in a second. The low potency FGAs are going to be thyrid thyridazine and chlorpromazine. Chlorpromazine. These are going to have more anticholinergic and antihistaminergic effects. They can also induce and uh, alpha one blockade effects, like we talked about earlier. Now, when it comes to the serum half life, all of these have a long serum half life, about 20 to 40 hours along with their serum metabolites still being active. These drugs are very highly lipophilic and they're often stored in body fat, so you wanna be careful when supplying in a more overweight person with these drugs, just in case these uh, drugs and metabolites get stored in fats and end up having more adverse effects than you would prefer. Now, let's start talking about these adverse effects. The most important and the, one of the most uh, highly tested adverse effect when it comes to high potency first generation antipsychotics, uh, and we're going to be talking about the first generation antipsychotics from now on, is going to be extrapyramidal signs, EPS, extrapyramidal signs. Now, these are more common in the high potency, aka haloperidol, trifluperazine, and flufenazine. And this is the main defining difference between first gen and second gen antipsychotics. We're going to talk about second gen in the next episode, in the next lecture, but this is the main defining reason, the defining factor between these two classes. Now, this is all going to arise due to blocking those D2 receptors in the nigrostriatal tract. And the symptoms you're going to see here is going to be very similar to Parkinson's disease, but they're going to present very acutely, very rapidly compared to Parkinson's. Parkinson's takes years to develop, but this is going to be very quick. And the acronym we use is called ADAPT. So each of these letters represents something. So let's start talking about the first two, which is acute dystonia, aka the uncontrollable muscle contractions. These usually present within days, hours to days of taking the, or of uh, getting um, affected by first gen high potency antipsychotics. The second uh, symptom is going to be akathisia. Akathisia is also called restlessness, right? In this case, a patient is going to have the urge to get up and walk around. And this is usually going to last from days to months, along with Parkinsonism, right? Uh, in this case, you're going to have patients who are bradykinesic. They're also going to have a tremor that lasts, you know, and they're usually in their hand. Their hand ends up shaking. And this, too, is going to last from days to months, and that's when it's going to present days to months, and it can last for a long time, sorry. And then the last, uh, last side effect or the last symptom is going to be something called tardive dyskinesia. This is going to, usually going to be orofacial, and it's going to result in stiff, jerky, involuntary movements. This will present usually months to years of chronic use of these high potency first generation antipsychotics. So this is very important. I highly recommend you guys understand the side effects because you may be presented with a patient who has a history of schizophrenia who is presenting with a tremor in their hands and it's been lasting for at least you know a few weeks what's usually happening, they're probably having the extrapyramidal symptoms that are common with high-potency first-gen antipsychotics, right? And they won't even tell you they're taking a high-potency one. They're going to end up saying that they're taking a first-line medication for schizophrenia. And that should clue you into haloperidol. Haloperidol is often the first-line med that's given for schizophrenia. So just keep that in mind. That's how they might present it, and you should be able to recognize what's happening. So when it comes to this uh, EPS, these symptoms of extra, these extrapyramidal symptoms, the main treatment you want to use is going to be a drug called benztropine. Now, benztropine uh, is an anticholinergic drug that blocks the M1 receptors, and it can improve acute, the acute dystonia that occurs. Now, um, that is specifically for the acute dystonia. When it comes to the akathisia, you can lower the dose of the FGA, the first gen. You can use propanolol. Okay, or you can also use benztropine, the same drug that we talked about earlier, and you can also give a benzodiazepine, which is a CNS depressant. For the Parkinsonism, you should definitely use benztropine because the symptoms are going to be very similar to acute dystonia and the tardive dyskinesia. This is something that's very difficult to treat, and often it's irreversible. It's it's not going to go away. It's going to last because people have been taking these drugs for almost uh, years when they start developing tardive dyskinesia. And this is the main reason why we don't use first-generation antipsychotics anymore because of this huge side effect profile. 
Now that's one of the things in the extraparameter science. Let's dive deeper into it and let's talk about this Parkinsonism. Specifically, we're going to talk about drug-induced Parkinsonism because it's very important to understand uh, that this is one of the side effects of haloperidol, of the high-potency first-gen antipsychotics. So the clinical diagnos diagnostic criteria for DIP or drug-induced Parkinsonism is that the patient must have a history of Parkinsonism without a history being present before the use of the offending drug and the onset of symptoms occurring when they started the drug. So that should clue you in to a drug-induced Parkinsonism rather than something else that's happening. Now this is again often associated with first generation antipsychotics as well as second gen aka risperidone. Risperidone is the only second gen that can lead to drug induced Parkinsonism all because it leads to blockade of those D2 receptors and this leads to chronically decreased dopamine levels like we talked about in the beginning because you have activation of D1, you have the blockade of D2 and that leads to decreased dopamine levels. This is a hallmark of Parkinson's disease, right? Decreased dopamine levels. That's why you see these drug-induced Parkinsonism symptoms. Now, this can also be caused by gastro gastrointestinal prokinetics. You can have calcium channel blockers that can cause it. Atypical antipsychotics like risperidone and antiepileptic drugs can also lead to this. So the main hallmark clinical test to use to diagnose someone is called a retropulsion or the pull test. And we're going to talk about this. Uh, we're going to show you a video right now. Uh, but just understand that this is the main thing, main test used uh, to look for postural stability in patients. Okay. So in the next slide, we're gonna I'm gonna show you a video of what the pull test looks like uh, for your guys' reference. Now, when you're treating drug-induced Parkinsonism, the one thing you do not want to do is give levodopa. Normally, you would give levodopa when someone has Parkinsonism because they have low dopamine levels. And by giving levodopa, you're supplementing their, their dopamine levels. In this case, you don't want to do that because the patients have a decreased dopamine level, not because they're not producing enough dopamine, but because the dopamine levels are being, uh, they have negative feedback upon them based off of the increased upregulation of the dopamine D1 receptors that are leading to increased cyclic AMP. So by giving levodopa, you're actually going to lead to more psychosis uh, than anything. You can use antimuscarinic agents like benztropine, like we said earlier, and uh, trihexyl, trihexafenadil, fenid, fenidil, trihexafenadil. You can also switch, uh, sorry, lower the dosage of the first gen, and you can switch to a second gen because the extrapyramidal symptoms do not occur in second generation uh, antipsychotics, and the drug-induced Parkinsonism is a second gen, uh, um, is a EPS symptom that occurs in first gen. So this is an example of the retropulsion test. Okay, this is what happens in the retropulsion test. As you can see, now I'm going to check right your here. balance a little bit. Push so this patient. Hold you now by the you shoulders and push you hand. forward or backwards and jerking. or sideways. Well, that okay. Okay. And I'll be here to hold you. I would not let you fall down. Eh? So so have trust and faith in me. All right. The Parkinson okay, tremor. Now the, the physician moves the patient side Don't to side, and then push he's gonna pull the patient. And look, okay. the patient's feet. I want you to look position. down here. He's gonna do it again. The patient's feet move because the patient has to st stabilize himself. Uh, and normally you don't have to do that. See, he has to move his feet a couple uh, steps there. in order to make sure he doesn't fall over. That is what the pull test looks like when it comes to a patient who has drug-induced Parkinsonism. So if you get a, uh, a pair of video like this, you should know what's happening now. Now so I'm going to check your balance. And uh, let's talk about the next adverse effect of the high potency uh, first-gen antipsychotics, and that is the neuroleptic malignant syndrome. This is more common in first-gen, although this can happen in any class of antipsychotics, and it can be caused by any dopamine blocking agent, uh, along with patients having a genetic predisposition for this, this uh, syndrome. But pretty much if you increase dopamine, if you give an antipsychotic, the neuromalignant syndrome can happen, the neuroleptic malignant syndrome. And this can also happen at any time. You do not have to look for a timeline for this drug. It doesn't matter. It can happen from the day one or from day 1001, whatever. Now, this is usually a life-threatening psychiatric emergency. It must be taken care of right away because of the symptoms. Symptoms include myoglobinuria or rhabdomyolysis. 
uh, and this is all because of the the muscle muscle cells breaking down okay you're gonna have fever as well as encephalopathy the vitals are going to be unstable the enzymes are going to be elevated like ck and you're also going to have something called lead pipe rigidity muscle rigidity and this is the hallmark okay the hallmark of n ms is going to be lead pipe rigidity and because of this rigidity you're also going to have the rhabdomyolysis occurring these two are very closely connected this should give you uh, a very good indication that someone is suffering from nms okay very very good indication do not miss this now this can be distinguished from serotonin syndrome because in the serotonin syndrome patients are going to have myoclonic rigidity which is different than lead pipe rigidity they're going to have high levels of serotonin right because they have uh, something that's released in serotonin whether it's a carcinoid tumor or whatever as well as flushing and diarrhea and all those other associated symptoms so it's very different when it comes to treatment you need to understand that you can do three things and you should do three things. Number one is dantrolene, which is a muscle relaxant that helps with the lead pipe rigidity. You can also give bromocryptine, which is a dopamine agonist, and uh, that's going to make antagonist, sorry, dopamine agonist, that's going to help with the antagonizing the dopamine blocking system. And finally, you should discontinue the causative agent. Now, when it comes to step one, you may have a vignette where a person comes to your clinic who's sedated, who's you know not very uh, responsive. The friend or the roommate tells you that he found the patient on the floor. He had been urinating really red urine recently. And when you do a physical exam, you see this very lead pipe, very rigid muscles. That should clue you in to someone having NMS, especially, especially if they're taking dopaminergic um, uh, substances like if they have schizophrenia and they're taking an antipsychotic that should definitely clue you in to NMS now that is one of the main side effects the next thing you need to know are the endocrine issues now again more common in first gen that hasn't changed but this usually affects the tubular infundibular system which is one of the four main dopamine pathways in the brain Now, normally dopamine is released from the hypothalamus to inhibit prolactin so let's write this here. So dopamine, really dopamine is going to lead to decreased levels of prolactin. That's normal, right? That's what normally happens. Now, when you have decreased dopamine levels due to blocking the D2 receptor in the prosynaptic neuron, you're going to lead to hyperprolactinemia, okay? You are going to have decreased dopamine, which is going to lead to high increased prolactin. So what does that mean? In females, you're going to see galactorrhea, and you can also see that sometimes in males, but usually it's females. In males, you will see gynecomastia, and you're also going to inhibit GnRH, gonadotropin-releasing hormone. This is going to lead to oligomenorrhea in females. They're not going to be able to have their periods. And in males, you're going to see loss of libido and impotence. Okay. So this is the endocrine uh, side effects. And then finally, these drugs can also affect the heart, by uh, causing several, not several, but one main thing, which is QT prolongation. Again, more common in the first gen, uh, high potency drugs, and it can lead to Trissot de Plantes. QT prolongation can end up uh, becoming Trissot de Plantes. Trissot de Plantes is this irregular cardiac rhythm right here, where you can see an increase and then a decrease, and then another increase in the amplitude of the uh, cardiac myocyte action potential okay so as you can see right here this is not normal this is all due to qt prolongation in bradycardia most likely this is going to be caused by haloperidol so if someone is taking haloperidol at maybe high doses and there's you're seeing qt prolongation the thing you want to watch out for in this case is going to be trissot de plantes and cardiac death now that's everything you pretty much need to know for the high potency first gen antipsychotics. I know it's a lot, so definitely spend your time with this content. Now we're going to talk about the low po effects of the low potency first generation antipsychotics. And the first effect is going to be the anti-muscarinic effects. So you're going to see this in the low potency drugs, the low potency first gen, like chloro, uh, chlorpromazine and thyroridazine. And it's not going to be really present in the high potency drugs. What it's going to end up happening is these drugs have ability to block the acetylcholine muscarinic receptors, leading to dry mouth, constipation, blurred vision, 
and urinary retention, those classic, classic uh, anticholinergic um, uh, side effects. So you want to watch out for a patient presenting with these side effects. Now you can also have orthostatic hypotension because you're blocking the alpha-1 adrenergic receptor. Again, more common in these uh, types of drugs, you're going to block the central and peripheral alpha-1 receptors. And this is going to lead to a decrease in phospholipase 3 and eventually is going to lead to a decrease in calcium release. And when the person stands up, they're going to have orthostatic hypotension that's accompanied with tachycardia. Now, this is very common during initialization and increasing the dose. Eventually, the tachycardia will uh, go back down to normal as they get stabilized. Now, the next thing they can also have in low potency is going to be the antihistaminergic effects. And in this case, you're going to be blocking the H1 receptor, uh, the histamine receptor in the central and peripheral nervous system. That's why you see these histamine uh, antihistaminergic effects, which can just lead to sedation, as you already know, uh, especially in the elderly, so you want to watch out. And then finally, the last thing you need to know is the ophthalmic deposits that can occur with these low potency. And I think this is one of the most high yield, highest yield um, side effects when it comes to low potency. The high potency have a lot of side effects, but this is pretty high yield. So the ophthalmic deposits are going to be different for both of these drugs. When it comes to chlorpromazine, you're going to have corneal deposits. And when it comes to thyroidazine, you're going to have retinal deposits. The way I like to remember it is the C in chlorpromazine uh, corresponds with the C in the cornea, and the thyroidazine corresponds, the T corresponds to the T in retinal. So those are the deposits you're going to get. Now that concludes our lecture today for the typical or the first generation antipsychotics. Thank you so much for watching. I know this was a beast of a video with so much information. So I highly, highly recommend you guys watch it a couple of times so you have a good understanding of all the information we went through so you know everything that you need to know for step one. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you don't know, you can find these lectures on your favorite podcast service for free. Just search Mad Medicine and you'll find us there. I highly recommend, though, you guys spend more time with this content because it's very dense and there's a lot of it. Thank you so much again and go ahead and continue on to the next lecture.